Zoroastrianism spans back approximately 3,500 years, all the way to ancient Persia, making it one of the oldest organized faiths in history, and arguably one of the world's first monotheistic religions. It was the state religion of ancient Persia up until around the 7th century, when it was dropped in favor of Islam during the Muslim conquest. There, Zoroastrian refugees, known as Parsis, fled from Persia to avoid persecution and emigrated to India, where the practice of Zoroastrianism continued to survive. Even today, the practice of Zoroastrianism continues as a minority religion, with an estimated 200,000 worshippers worldwide. At its peak some 3,000 years ago, Zoroastrianism was at the core of one of the world's largest empires, the Persian Empire. The first Persian Empire, founded by Cyrus the Great, saw Zoroastrianism flourish, and though it was indeed the state religion, it was not imposed upon anyone who didn't wish to follow it. Cyrus the Great's rule allowed for religious independence, which is congruent with the Zoroastrian dogma, most specifically the Law of Asher, or the Law of Truth and Righteousness, which Cyrus the Great's reign heavily incorporated. These beliefs were so prominent that they spread through the Silk Road, a famous trading route that ran through China, to the Middle East, and all the way through Europe. Over the next thousand years, Zoroastrianism would continue to thrive over two subsequent Persian dynasties, the Parthian Empire and the Sasanian Empire, where the religion would remain dominant well into the Common Era until the 7th century. Some speculate that the fundamentals of Zoroastrianism shaped the major Abrahamic religions of today. After all, there is the concept of a single god who sees everything. There's a day of judgement, where the good and the bad will be separated. There is a heaven, where the moral and pious will enter for all eternity. And by contrast, there is a hell, where the sinful and the wicked will go to suffer. Most of what we know about Zoroastrian belief comes from the Avesta, a collection of religious scriptures believed to have been written by the prophet Zoroaster, who the religion appears to be named after. Zoroastrian tradition details that Zoroaster had a divine vision of a single deity when he was partaking in a pagan ritual. After having this vision and learning the name of this deity, Zoroaster began to spread the word of what he had seen, and that this one deity, known as Ahura Mazda, was now the sole deity who should receive worship. Zoroastrianism beliefs teach followers to live a moral life in order to appease their god Ahura Mazda. Failure to do this will result in familiar consequences that we see in today's major religions. The forces of good and evil are believed to constantly be at odds with each other, and humans can choose whether to follow the path of good, which is known as Asher, or the path of evil, which is known as Druj. Each path leads to heaven or hell respectively. Truth and dishonesty are two of the core tenets of Zoroastrianism. It is the moral Zoroastrian who aims to tell the truth at all times, whilst the unpracticed Zoroastrian is more likely to be deceitful. Deceit isn't the only surefire way to end up in the Zoroastrian hell, however. Murder, slander, abuse of animals, and even being lazy are all big taboos within the religion. And should a person continuously demonstrate such behaviours, their fate becomes pretty bleak indeed. So what can one expect to find in this hell? Hell in Zoroastrian is believed to be divided into sections, depending on the sins. There is a space for those who have slandered, a place for those who have murdered, and a place for those who have lied. In this example, it would seem that those sent here are grouped together based on their most prominent sin. For those who have sinned so egregiously, there is said to be a giant pit that is so deep and so dark that there is no light there, and those sent here move around in total darkness. Worse yet, the entirety of hell is believed to be a place of fire, perhaps more akin to how we would visualize the biblical hell. There are also believed to be demons that occupy the hellish landscape and are known to enforce the torments that sufferers will incur. These demons are believed in some beliefs to be employed by the chief devil known as Aishma, though Aishma's role is widely disputed from being an overarching lord of hell to a more abstract representation of evil. In order to get a more concrete view of the Zoroastrian hell, however, we ought to look to the Middle Persian book of devout Zoroastrian Ardavirath. 
The Book of Ardavira, otherwise known as the Book of Righteous Wiraz, is an 8,000 word text written in Middle Persian. The book describes the dream journey of a devout Zoroastrian named Wiraz, who, in an effort to prove life after death, travels through to the next world, where he not only visits hell, but offers us a detailed account of what transpires down there. The date of the book is unknown to us, though it is speculated by historians that it may have been written as late as the 9th or 10th century, a couple of hundred years after the Zoroastrians had fled Persia during the Muslim conquest. In the story, Wiraz is chosen for his good morality to go on a journey to the next world, to prove that there is an afterlife and to justify Zoroastrian belief. This was during a period in the land of Iran where other cultures promoting a myriad of different gods, beliefs and ideas were confusing the average Zoroastrian, and either challenging his ideals to the point that he began to doubt his way, or seducing him to worship more exotic pagan gods. So Wiraz drinks a mixture of wine, mang, and a divine plant known as Halma, which sees his soul journey to the next world. When he arrives, he is greeted by a beautiful woman named Den, who represents his faith and his virtue. He is then guided across the Chinvat Bridge, otherwise known as the Bridge of Judgment, which separates the world of the living from the world of the dead. This is a bridge that all souls must cross when they die, and appears to be the natural progression from life into death. Afterwards, Wiraz is ushered onto the Star Track, the Moon Track, and the Sun Track, places outside of heaven that are reserved for those who though had failed to conform to Zoroastrian law, still led good and moral lives. This is an interesting feature of the religion, that even though one does not submit themselves to Zoroastrianism, nor acknowledges Ahura Mazda as the one true god, one might still be eligible for a peaceful life after death, and though they may not share in the spoils of heaven, at the very least, they won't suffer in hell for having not converted. By the time Wiraz enters the heavens, he meets Ahura Mazda, who shows him the blessed souls who were faithful and devout. Each person who makes it to the Zoroastrian heaven is described as living their own ideal life that they had lived on earth, a perfect version of their own mortal experience, if you will. Having seen the great heights of the heavens, it is time for Wiraz to descend into hell, where he is shown the suffering of the wicked. One of the most interesting elements about Wiraz's journey is that the first 15 chapters are dedicated to his visit to heaven, where he sees everything that there is to see in a matter of brief moments. However, it then takes him over 70 chapters to get through hell, which just goes to show the sheer scale between heaven and hell, and how elaborate and diabolical one is compared to the other. Wiraz tells us that after having visited the heavens, the angels take him by the hand and bring him to a great river, that is gloomy and desolate. On the river, he saw many souls, some who were drowning, some who swam with great difficulty, and some who crossed it with ease. The angel explains to Wiraz that this river in hell is made up of tears shed by the living for the departed. The angel explains that these tears are unlawful and that they swell here to this river. Those who drown here are those who received many tears after their passing. Those who are able to cross the river with more ease are those who had less tears shed for them. Put simply, tears should not have been shed for the departed because this was not only unlawful in Zoroastrian belief, but also damaging to those who had found themselves at the river. A stinking cold wind is said to come up and greet sinners in hell. As Wiraz observes, one soul is struck by the wind. This soul then sees a naked, decaying, spotted woman who is hideous, filthy and stinking. This woman tells the soul that she is an amalgamation of all of his evil thoughts, evil words and evil deeds, kind of a contrast from the beautiful woman Den that Wiraz had seen in heaven. In this instance, the woman is so vile and horrifying to gaze upon that it is reflective of how wicked a life that this soul had led whilst he was alive. After beholding her terrifying form and hearing her chilling explanation, the soul makes an effort to be free of her and takes his chances by running further into hell. After this encounter, Wiraz tells us that an entity known as Shrosh the Pious and an angel named Adar take him by the hand and lead him unhurt into the greedy jaws of hell. 
Here, Wiras explains that he experienced both hot and cold temperatures that were near unbearable, and that the stench here was terribly overcoming, to the point that if one inhaled the air, they would struggle and fall. He also explains that it is very dark here, so dark in fact that it was necessary to hold the angel's hand, otherwise he would have been lost. Due to this darkness, it is impossible to keep track of time, and Wiras suggests that it is common to hear prisoners declaring that they had served 9,000 years in hell, when in actuality, they had only served a matter of weeks. Furthermore, the darkness also provides a sense of loneliness, and because one cannot see anything, it is easy to believe that one is experiencing this suffering all by themselves. Worse yet, within this darkness are noxious creatures, or demons, known as Kraftstras, which are highest mountains, who tear and seize and plague the souls of the wicked. Then Wiras came to a place in hell where he saw the soul of a man who suffered an elaborate torture. A snake entered the man's body and slithered out through his mouth, and many other snakes seized his limbs, causing him great anguish. When Wiras asked what this man did when he was living to deserve such a punishment, Shros the pious and Adar the angel explained that this was the soul of a wicked man, and that he was wicked because he committed sodomy, and allowed another man to engage with his body sexually. So, not only does this reveal a Zoroastrian attitude towards homosexuality, but it also reveals a particularly harsh consequence for those who weren't heterosexual. Whereas then sees the soul of a woman who is forced to eat cup after cup of the impurity and filth of men. Now, we are not told what this impurity and filth are exactly, but it can be assumed that this could be human excrement, urine, semen, or any other bodily fluid. Wiras is sickened by what he sees, and he asks Shros the Pious and Adar the Angel what this woman could have possibly done to deserve such a punishment. His guides explain that the woman was wicked because she had not abstained, nor lawfully withheld herself, and approached water and fire during her menstruation. Unfortunately, they don't go into much more detail about her crime, and so, whilst her transgression appears to be related to her menstruation, we cannot know for sure what exactly transpired here. One idea, however, is that the woman here altered her menstrual cycle somehow, and prevented herself from conceiving a child, which in those times would have been a great crime against the community itself. Wiras then sees the soul of a man whose skin was being stretched off his face. When he inquires as to what this man did to deserve such a punishment, his guides tell him that this is the soul of a wicked man who killed a pious man. We can gather from this that the punishment for murder, particularly the murder of someone righteous, is to suffer a painful torture that seemingly never ends. For Wiras noted that though his skin was stretched wide, he was never actually killed. Wiras also sees the soul of a man whose jaw ever poured the impurity and menstrual discharge of women, and that he was forced to cook and eat his own child. When Wiras asked his guides what this man could have done to deserve such a punishment, they replied that he had intercourse with a menstruous woman, and that every single time someone does this, it is a sin of fifteen and a half tanapers, a tanapur being a mortal sin. Wiras tells us that everywhere in hell, there are crying men who sob from hunger and thirst, and that some are driven to such madness that they tear out their own hair and beards, they devour their own blood, and foam at the mouth. His guides tell him that this is the fate for men who talk too much. In this hell, Wiras sees women hanging by their breasts, and that they are possessed by noxious creatures for the crime of adultery. Shros the pious and Adar the angel explain that this is what awaits the souls of wicked women, who leave their husbands for the affections of other men. These noxious creatures described here, known as Krufstar, appear to gnaw on the legs, necks, and middle parts of the damned, and separate their limbs from their bodies. With this in mind, Wiras presents the idea that the Zoroastrian hell is full of men and women who are missing body parts. For this punishment, his guides explain that this is what will happen to those who conferred with demon kind. Later, Wiras sees leaders of his time being flogged by demons, where serpents are even used in the process to intensify the pain. To this, his guides explain that not even those who are powerful in their mortal lives are exempt from the punishments in hell, and that those who have ruled poorly, 
or hypocritically, will find themselves at the mercy of demon kind. Those who are wealthy in their mortal lives also find themselves in precarious situations in hell. For those who do not share their wealth, or lord it above others, are seen to be attacked by demons who trample, smite, and brutalize them for eternity. Those who commit apostasy might also be subject to some kind of transmutation, whereby their bodies become infused with that of a serpent. It is here that Wira sees a being with the head of a man and the body of a snake, for which his guides explain to him that this was a man who had quit his religious obligations and slivered into hell on his own volition. Cannibals run amok in the Zoroastrian hell too, where men and women scatter about the realm like zombies in search of human flesh. These men and women are believed to have been condemned for greed and selfishness, whose appetites have now been increased to such ungodly levels that they will stop at nothing to consume everything and everyone around them. After a seemingly endless tour of hell and all its horrors, Srosh and Adar take Wiraz to Takati Dai Ti, which is below the Chinwood Bridge, somewhere in the desert in the middle of the earth. Here lies another sort of hell. The groaning and cries of Ariman and the demons and the demonesses and many other souls of the wicked came so from that place, because I considered that they would shake the seven regions of the earth which heard that noise and groaning. And I entreated Shros the pious and Adar the angel, thus, carry me not here, but turn back. Shros and Adar acknowledge Wiraz's dread, but that doesn't stop them from forcing him to go anyway. Here, Wiraz tells us that he begrudgingly agreed, but that of all the hells, this one gave him the most dread to enter. Wiraz sets the scene for us, telling us quite bleakly, And I saw the darkest hell, which is pernicious, dreadful, terrible, very painful, mischievous and foul-smelling, and after further observation, it appeared to me as a pit, to the bottom of which a thousand cubits would not reach. And though all the wood which is in the world were all put onto the fire in the most stinking and gloomy hell, it would never emit a smell, and again, also, as close to the ear to the eye, and as many as the hairs on the mane of a horse, so close and many in number, the souls of the wicked stand, but they see not and hear no sound one from the other. Everyone thinks thus, I am alone, and for them are the gloom of darkness, and the stench and fearfulness of the torment and punishment of hell, of various kinds, so that whoever is only a day in hell, cries out thus, are not these 9,000 years yet completed, when they should release us from this hell? As with the previous chapters, however, this hell appears to be much like the one before, if not completely pitch black. There are still demons torturing humans, there are serpents feasting on flesh, there are cannibals and mutilations, and ungodly acts that see men eating their feces. Yet there is a sense that these areas here in chakat e daitir are reserved for a different breed of mankind, perhaps the worst of the worst. Here, Shros and Adar explain that there are murderers, rapists, fraudsters, abusers, and ultimately, enemies of God. Self-mutilation appears to be a prominent torture that occurs in this dark realm, where either a person is driven to insanity and hurts themselves, or is somehow manipulated by powers outside of their own into decimating their own bodies. We see in one section that women are primarily the victims of this suffering, who gnash at their own breasts, stab themselves, or burn themselves on ovens, for reasons that aren't entirely clear. Of this, Shros and Adar explain that these are women who have neglected their children, had abortions, or defied and or cuckolded their husbands. Interestingly, much of the later chapters focus on the punishments of women, which vary in such diabolically specific ways that it does beg the question as to how or why the original authors would think them up in the first place. Furthermore, it would seem that whilst many of the crimes listed here are quite specific, such as men who do not pay their bills, or men who talk behind other men's backs, the women by comparison have one reoccurring sin that warrants a plethora of severe punishments, and that's the sin of infidelity. 
There's also a strange reoccurrence and perhaps odd fascination with the consumption of menstrual blood and how if a woman is evil, this will be her punishment when she reaches hell. There's at least half a dozen of these descriptions scattered throughout Wiras' journey, where he either witnesses women drinking their own bodily fluids or witnesses men eating their own excrement. On the other hand, we do see Wiras witness a man who is punished by having semen dripped into his eyes, mouth and nose, and we are told that this is the punishment for men who sleep with other men's wives. As you might gather, the original authors took adultery on both sides very seriously, and that of all the crimes that are listed throughout Wiras' journey, infidelity is one of the more frequent. Additionally, considering how sickening the punishments are, it would seem that the original authors wanted to convey a dimension that was so horribly disgusting that it not only repulsed anyone from ever wanting to go there, but also shocked them into behaving as more stand-up, God-fearing adults. Towards the end of the book, we find small sections dedicated to those who have abused animals, where ironically, in hell, the animals then get to enact those same actions unto man. In one instance, Wiras sees a man being trampled by goats, after having been unkind to goats in his mortal life. Another man is seen to be encumbered with heavy weight, and marched up and down by donkeys and other livestock. At the very last chapter, we see Wiras witness Ariman, the central figurehead of the underworld, and the Zoroastrian version of Satan. Whilst Wiras does not commune with the devil himself, he does see the devil parade around the realm of hell, openly mocking those human souls who now reside there. As Wiras tells us, this evil figure doesn't seem to partake in the punishments himself, but rather goads and taunts the damned souls forever thereafter. The rewards and punishments encountered in Arda Virath reflect the Zoroastrian emphasis on ethical conduct which highlights the importance of leading a righteous life on earth. The text encourages virtuous actions, upholds the values of truth, justice and goodness, and instills a sense of personal responsibility for one's deeds. I mean, the alternative is to quite literally eat your own poop. By revealing these dark consequences of human choices, the Book of Ardavirath serves as more than just a moral guide. It's a warning that if one does not embrace God and live in accordance with divine principles, they will pay for it dearly in the long run. In addition to the troubling themes, the Book of Arda Virath demonstrates the influence of broader cultural and religious currents. It interwines elements from Persian mythology, Gnostic traditions, and even echoes of ancient Near Eastern beliefs. The text employs rich symbolism, such as the Bridge of Chinvat, which represents the threshold between the material and spiritual realms, testing the purity of the soul. These syncretic influences and motifs transcend time, speaking to the timeless quest for spiritual understanding and enlightenment. As always guys, if you've enjoyed today's episode, then don't forget to give this video a thumbs up, and don't forget to subscribe for more content just like this. Until next time.